This place would be perfect for an antique store. It gets a ton of traffic it's been vacant since 1887. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Hey everybody, it's George the Antique Nomad. I am at the Northfield Flea Market in Springfield, Illinois. I have been here all the last couple of days helping a couple of different clients with very large collections, figure out what to do with some of them. I have a van full of merchandise now to take home. And even though I have practically no room left, I could not resist being here on a Saturday morning to go to the local flea market. So this is the Northfield Flea Market. It is open March through November. It's on Old Highway 66 and just off of the freeway here. It's a nice sort of medium-sized flea market. A lot of the folks come here regularly and so they have storage lockers where they just put everything in and then they come the next weekend. But there will be some vendors who are not here most of the time as well. And we're going to look at a little of both because we're looking for antique and vintage that we can resell. I love what they did with the tree here. They had to cut it, so they turned it into art. Now, hopefully the sound and the quality of the video will be good. I haven't had to use my phone in a long time, and I didn't really come prepared for that, but my camera decided to take the morning off. It's having some sort of a problem. Here we go. Now we're seeing some old stuff. The tractor seat is cool. The horse collar mirror, uh, I see Hames, I see some Wagner wear, cast iron there. So at least we're getting into some older stuff. I have a lot of these types of things right now, though. Now, military insignia are things we see for sale at swap meets often. However, this guy has done something I don't usually see. He's given really good attention to detail here. He talks about various things that these various service battalions have done in their history where they're from, what you're looking at, so you don't have to guess. And that's great because a lot of the people who buy this are actually women who are looking for things that relate to their father's service in order to do a shadow box or a vignette or have some use for his military insignia other than having them sit in a drawer. So it's great that this fellow has not assumed that you just know what all this stuff is. Okay, well let's see what else is in the market because we're really looking for antique and vintage. These folks have a lot of plastic toys and, you know, some of these are going to be collectible. You really have to know your more modern stuff from having lived it or really studied it because there's so many little variations on even plastic toys made in the last 30 years. There can be very subtle little differences between two things that make a huge difference in value. There's military khaki in the old Coleman lanterns there. Little travel bar, a nice old clock. And I've always wanted to have a set of these grocery baskets from the 50s. I wonder how much these are going to sell for. Well, I am excited about this. It'll clean up and it looks a little crooked because I have it downhill. The nice thing is it's a lot of little flat things I can stick around stuff and the rack holds. Otherwise, I could not have bought it because I would not get it in this car. But this is a bucket list item for me. I remember these from early, early childhood, and then they all disappeared. And I've just always wanted to have this to sell. And honestly, if you sold them by the basket, there's definitely money in it. I think I got it for a decent price. All right, so we're gonna step towards the back here. I'll try not to be too bouncy. Like I said, I have to use the phone today. I haven't had to do that for a while, so I'll try to walk real evenly and slowly here past a whole lot of new stuff. I'm going to head to the back corner because I see a lot of glass and china on the table here and I see something right away that looks older. I see some Roseville so we're going to head towards that. So this gentleman is selling off his brother's estate and that's a sad thing but his brother was a super collector and had a ton of cool stuff and I actually put $60 worth aside already. He has these lithophanes with the women in the bottom. I think you can see her up in the sunlight. They're newer. They're more recent issues, but they are definitely cool. The Cambridge Seagull Flower Frog is a nice elegant glass piece from about 1940. These are marked Jane 
B. And anything by them tends to be expensive. It's kind of like Armor Bronze and some of those companies. So something to look for. Scotty bookends are cool. This little guy is a Royal Dalton Sheepdog. There's the mark on the foot. He's got a bunch of the Christ Psycho Ceramics, and I did buy one or two pieces, which I'll show you later. This particular guy is cute, but he's missing something. But they did all these things with the cute little rhinestones. The salt and pepper shakers are neat. There's a clown. More salt and peppers. This guy with the big face. I bought the drippings jar out of this set, because grease drippings are something people used to save. Now he's put some new stuff out since I put my pile aside, so let's see what this is. Looks like an American company from the Midwest. I do not recognize it offhand. It might be one of the Whitehall, Illinois companies. This piece here is Roseville. You can see the R stamp by the vent hole there. That is Carnelian. A lot of Royal Dalton ladies. The dinnerware here, or kitchenware I should say, is Roseville as well. And of course these pieces are familiar. The Zephyr Lily tall vase in the blue is very pretty. The Goble Friars. He's got the Briars priced at about 20 each, which is about what most of them sell for, so I didn't go for those. But I did get some of the Shawnee pieces. These are all cute too. I could probably buy all of them, but I, I got three or four and decided I had enough. Hummels, and this is also by Goble that made the Hummels, but this is a redhead by Charlotte Beige, Little Miss Koi. A lot of fun piggy banks. Piggy banks are called that because pig, P-Y-G-G, -G, was the old English spelling for the material, the clay they used to make banks, and someone thought that that meant pig like a pig, and it just caught on. So we still call them piggy banks. And I had him set aside a Miss Piggy piggy bank by Sigma from the day. This is also by Sigma. This is a little flower base. big for your pond area. Yeah. True. If you had something itty bitty that Another Christ that, guy. I bought his mate. Story. The only reason I didn't buy him is that the hair is missing and the cold paint often comes off. See where the red is worn and the white. These are either Mott Blends or Kate Finch. And tomato wear here. Cute little QP 1920s bowl. There was a bunch of Holt Howard Calk Rouge, but I bought it because my mom collects it, so it's in a bag. A lot of this is Joe St. Clair and Mosser and some of the 1980s and 90s designers. He's They're nice lamps, pieces. He's got ashtrays, he's got vases. You've got quite a collection to sell, don't you? <laughs> he's got a thousand paperweights. Wow. Neat. Well, he, he collected good stuff at least. You'll have, you'll have fun with it. Now you might not believe this, uh -huh. but he bought a piece of Tiffany, signed Tiffany, with the base. Naked eye couldn't see it, he had pointed out to me. Really, where the signature was? Yeah, the early ones are real obscure. He traded that for $50,000 worth of Shawnee pie. Wow. Wow, 50,000 worth of Shawnee has to be one of the biggest collections in existence. <laughs> oh, and I see you've got one of the bathing beauties, that's neat. Well, that was definitely the booth for me, because there's lots of other stuff that's probably good. I saw a guy with a bunch of Nike air pump shoes and stuff that would be great for resellers, but it's just not what I do, because it's not old enough for me, and I have enough to put online, so I'm not necessarily looking to get more of that kind of stuff. Probably not old, but he's neat looking. Fishing lures, this looks like the plastic era. Ammo boxes can be collectible, but these are all pretty recent. Oh. This guy's got older glass eyes. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. Well, you know, find out how much he is. He's a mallard. The one next to it's more interesting for the paint, but I think it's been repainted. I liked it when there's nobody there. 
Well, the Weller pot on the right was $10, and the decoy on the left was 30 but it was made in Chicago, and he said his grandfather made it, so I have the name of the maker and the era, and that's why I went ahead and paid a little more for that. It's also got glass eyes. It looks like 1920s, so I think between everything I bought, some things were a little better deals than others, but it'll all work out to a nice overall total. And I got some really good things that I think will resell pretty quickly. The good thing is they have snow cones because it is getting hot. So I think I'm going to have a snow cone. And then I've got just a little bit more looking to do and it'll be off to somewhere else. These folks have some stuff that is on the collectible side and everything says half off sticker price. So they probably were in a mall or a shop. Now, a lot of times this scares people off at a flea market, but not me because if they had them priced right in the store, and I can get them for half, and it's something I have a customer for. Well, you know, it's easy money. Not everything has to be a nickel or a quarter to make money in this business, particularly when you have customers that you know and you know what they're looking for. However, I don't see much that is really up my alley here. This is fun the way that they had all of these trade card looking things, but this is reproduction from the 70s. Cute though. This guy's got the bottles, but he's also got a pair of green candlesticks that look interesting and some other old things. So let's see what this is. Beautiful rose plate with the Moriaga beading. Crown masterpieces of painting. This one's sort of falling apart, but that may be perfect for somebody who wanted to frame them. Well, that turned out to be fun. I found some pretty nice things, and boy, Springfield is a good place to find stuff, it seems. I'm going to head on to some other places now that I'll show you, but in the meantime, if you take a moment to click that subscribe button, you will be able to also click that bell to be notified of future videos. I have membership programs. You can look at those by clicking the join button below or looking for the link in the description. And please leave a comment and let us know you're out there. I really enjoy bringing this stuff to you and it's always nice to know what you like and what you'd like to see more. So let's get back to the video. This place would be perfect for an antique store. It gets a ton of traffic and they've got to be motivated because it's been vacant since 1887. That was actually the year that Robert Todd Lincoln donated his father Abraham's only home in Springfield, Illinois to the National Park Service and you can come and tour. It is an amazing neighborhood, very well preserved. The Lincolns were upper middle class, aspirational, young couple with a bunch of other people like them in this neighborhood when it formed in the 1830s and 40s. Springfield had been named the state capital. It moved here from Vandalia because this was a more central location and the Lincolns moved with it. Springfield was very young then, only about 10,000 people and most of them were immigrants from Ireland, Germany, Canada, various points beyond. About 40% of the people here were not born in the U.S. It's rather something, though, to try to put yourself back in this place and time when this truly was the landscape. Things were small. Everybody knew everybody. It's the bucolic notion of America in the mid-19th century. The backyard has been left sparse by the Park Service, but in the Victorian era, you would have had gardens here. You would have kept small game for eating, like rabbits or chickens, and also to lay eggs. You might have had a carriage house if you were really wealthy in traveling distances, which Abraham Lincoln did. Most people didn't have a horse in town because you didn't need one. You just walked everything. And there's the privy. They have dug the privy, and there are some things in the historic museum they found. And here's a few of them here. Those are flint glass, early pressed glass goblets. So they would ring like a bell because they had a lot of flint in them or lead to help clarify the glass and those would have been considered better quality in the 1840s because they were very precisely molded and not crooked like the hand-blown pieces. So that was new technology. 
you see the blue and white plates uh, from the original dinner service, and there is an intact one as well as the remains of broken ones. That's what got thrown down. The privy typically were the broken things, so it's rare to find intact pieces like they have here. Now, when your dad went off to the garage to tinker when you were a kid, you may not have realized that part of what he was doing was trying to get a little bit of a break so that he could think clearly about things, and Abraham Lincoln was no exception. One of the things he made during his tinkering was this little cart made for his sons to play with. I really just want the nameplate off the door. That's really all I'm asking for. You'd think they could just do me one little favor. Perspective's important when you read historic signs. This one says that he purchased the home in 1844 for $1,500, and you think, wow, what an amazing deal. Actually, that was twice what a typical house cost in 1844. Everybody had to move from Vandalia to Springfield simultaneously, so there was a housing boom, and this was before a lot of things were manufactured by machines, so houses were expensive until the late Victorian era. You could get a house for $1,500 as late as 1940. But it wouldn't have been this house, and this one is pretty special. Here's the group forming for the next tour, and it takes hours to go on a tour on the 4th of July, which is when I'm here, so I'm not going to wait for that. But we can see how pretty the neighborhood is and how it's hardly changed at all since the time of Lincoln. Oh, wait, except for all of this over here. But we'll see more of that in our next video. Well, I'm feeling much more refreshed after a shower and a shave. I always save the showering for after the flea market because you get up at the crack of dawn and you know you're going to be going through some dirty and dusty stuff. But it was worth it. I found some really good things. Of course, I already showed you the little stand with the baskets from the 1950s that had to be put in many pieces into the car so we're going to hold off on that but i will show you again the decoy i really did think he was very nice and he's got good age and i have a decoy collector that's why i stretched just a little on the price but then i got this for ten dollars in the space that had all the beautiful nippon and moriaga and the fancy book he didn't seem to care about this because as he said it, oh, that's so plain. Well, it is. It's plain Weller from the 1930s. It's a great color. And I am very partial to it for $10. I feel very happy about that. Then I told you I spent 60 bucks on a bunch of stuff from that fellow who was selling off his brother's estate. This one I thought was really cute. Not very nice to the folks in Illinois, though. It says, in memory of Sam. Now, you could have any state or locale put into this poem back then so don't take it personally illinois but it says dreamer i dreamed that i died and to heaven did go i rang the bell gaily and bowed very low i said i'm from illinois my how they did stare come right in said saint peter you're the first one from there these were novelties done by carlton ware in the 1930s and this is an english maker so you would have seen them with any place you wanted put in. The drippings jar. Drippings were grease drippings that people would use in lieu of butter, in lieu of lard. It was just a way to reuse your stuff in your kitchen. These are often greased out to the point where they're not viable, so I was happy to find this one. It's Hazel Atlas from the 1930s. Now, black on white is probably the lowest dollar as far as the kitchen glass of the 1930s go, but Black and white are also very stark and go well with any decor, so they do sell. Miss Piggy was not $110 like the price tag said. She is a bank. I believe she's worth about $35 to $40. The Sigma, the taste setter marks. Hansen licensed Sigma, which was out of Japan, to make these when the show was at the peak of popularity around 1980. And there are some pieces like the hand mirror that go for as much as a couple hundred dollars. Piggy Banks, there were a whole bunch. I picked this one because it was Christmas and because it just seemed nuts. And I liked that. It was such a fun display with all those strange psycho ceramic guys. He had just a lot of really fun whimsy. I had to get this guy because it's baseball season and this guy is the manager. And that one says, made in Japan. 
So we're starting to get back to the made in Japan mark once you get to paper labels in the 1970s. This little German Shepherd is a Hagen Renneker. They made lots of animal figures. They were out of San Dimas near San Diego. This one's 1989. They are still in production, but a lot of these have been discontinued or the colors are different now and they are collectible. I expect him to sell for eight to ten dollars, although the friend I'm doing the show with has a German Shepherd and if she wants her, well then it's probably going to be a gift. I said I bought some Shawnee pottery. Here are the two pieces I picked out of the giant collection that the fellow had. He only had a few with him, but I picked this one because you don't see the colors very often. Now somebody at one point thought this was worth two hundred dollars. I find that very very difficult to believe, but it is an unusual color combination. The kitty looks awfully hot wearing that outfit. No wonder it's saying meow. And on the bottom it says Shawnee USA. Very good mark there. That was their later embossed mark. And then the other one I got was the pig, Smiley Pig, with the clover on his back. The yellow again is a little more unusual color. These colored ones were later in the production to help keep the line going so they didn't last as long. Right behind that I have this. This is a souvenir shoe and if you look closely it says that it is from the 1939 Golden Gate Exposition which is the World's Fair held on Treasure Island off of San Francisco. By the Second World War that island had become a big navy base where my dad served in the early 60s. It is now a big park from what I understand again. So it went back to its park-like nature. So this is cross collectible. Shoe collectors will like it and World's Fair collectors as well. What else did I get in this $60 pile? I got one Christ Psycho Ceramic. This one isn't particularly bejeweled with rhinestones like a lot of them are, but he does have that crazy look. They're all a little bit odd. Some of them are down and out. Some of them are nuts. But a lot of them were banks, and this one's got its original stopper in it. This has the Japan-only paper label, also used in the 1960s and 70s. So I ended up getting 15 items. I think I threw an extra 10 bucks to the guy. So I got 15 items for $70. I thought that was an awfully good price, considering these are cute things that people do buy. My mother collects this. This is Holt Howard Coq Rouge. At some point I'm going to show my mom's collections just for fun. This particular line was one of the first that they made after the Christmas lines when Holt Howard started to really come on strong as a major supplier to J.C. Penney's. And one of the things they did very wisely is support their own brand as well. You can see the original tag on here, Color Boost for Your Dining Roost, Table Flare by Holt Howard. This is the salt and pepper shaker. At one time somebody thought they were going to get $80 for these. Well. Those days never really happened. The vase is hard to find. It's just a very small bed vase with the tail open. And then this pitcher is a quart-sized milk pitcher. And what's really important on these is that the red be in really good shape. It's not worn, it's not chipped, it wasn't dishwashed away. This has a nice date on the bottom, 1964. Holt Howard kept adding on to this line because it did very well at J.C. Penney's and was a mainstay for Holt Howard and Penney's for a long time. This one's dated 1961. I believe you'll see them as far back as 1958 when the line started. This one says 59 here. And then I got a little bit of glass. I tried to be careful about glass. I love it, but I have a lot. But I got these because they're fruit and they're rainbow glass, these little pears here. No pontal on the bottom at all. They would actually blow from the top and then seal the piece with the stem. So that's a clue if you see these out in the wild without labels, because most of them are without labels, so that you know you're not looking at something brand new made in China. They don't have a lot of wear, but these were done around 1970. And they typically sell for about $20 to $25 each for me. Something else that was out there that was worth having is this gum rack. Little racks and display things. People love to buy these. They like them for their collections. They like them because they have store display and graphic appeal. 
Now the Beeman's looks older than the rest because they never changed their logo. Dentine is something that comes along more in the 50s and the chiclets here with wow now new taste treat and all the different colors. So this is about the time that you see a lot of differentiation where old lines started being broken into lots of different flavors and varieties and that's about 1960. I bought one when we had the meetup in Princeton, Indiana and they kind of looked at me a little bit funny but I'll be darned if I didn't sell it for $45 at the next show. I did, and I think this one may sell for a similar price. Here's another thing that came up in Springfield, and this is a sleeper. It doesn't look like much. It is old store stock. It's been a little bit beaten up. This thing's never been out of the package, and yet it's a little worn on the surface. They probably had a stack of these that sat in some dusty warehouse for ages. Like I was saying at the flea market, you really have to know your plastic toys just like any other category. Well, what I knew about this was that it was original Hot Wheels, and how did I know that? Well, there is no UPC code. UPC codes don't come into existence until 1974. So this is not a reproduction. This is original from 1968. It's got the original date on the bottom as well. This rather unassuming piece that was not made for long, even though the packaging isn't perfect, the fact that it's on the original package means this is somewhere in the $200 to $300 range now. So this was a big score. And there was one other big score I want to show you too. And that would be this. I have it spread out as much as I can over a chair so you get the idea. This is chenille. This is the type of chenille blanket sold by the roadsides to tourists going to Florida back in the 1950s and 60s. This is a double peacock. The double peacock is one of the hardest to find. It was very popular. They got used a lot. They got put in the washer a lot things shredded, they got thin, they got thrown away. They are very desirable now. This one is in wonderful condition. I don't see any holes or stains. The colors are great and this is going to have good value. Well I sure had a great time in the land of Lincoln and I've had a lot of fun bringing you a look at a neat little flea market and some of the stuff that I found there. I did get to go to one other place that was quite extensive in Springfield, so please check out my next video here. If you're not already a subscriber, click the subscribe button and then you can click that bell to be notified when it comes out. In the meantime, it's great to have you all with me. I'm George the Antique Nomad. I'll see you with another adventure from somewhere in antiques and collecting soon. So bye-bye now. Talk to you again. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!